Thank you, Father. And hello, everyone, and blessed feast of the Sunday of the Cross. So my talk is titled on church etiquette as a path to prayer. We weren't born in a barn, and we shouldn't worship like we're in one either, even though we are in a barn. So this was actually an article I wrote for an inquirer who came in and saw that there was a lot of things going on. He didn't understand them. He said, could you please understand? make some sense of what is happening and so I said yes I'll write you a little thing and it ended up being a little art a little piece on how to properly behave in church so I decided once we were doing talks I would just modify it a little bit for everyone here and then we would go forward I also appreciate that today is the day we're doing this as we saw one of the rare uh, liturgical oddities that we have where we prostrate on Sundays there's only two instances in which this can happen it is on this Sunday and it is if the, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross falls on a Sunday as well. So those are the only two instances in which you can do prostrations on a Sunday. We will talk about that later. So for the inquirer who first enters an Orthodox Church, much of what he seems, sees comes across as foreign and exotic, and at times it might even be unintelligible. For my first liturgy, everything was in Greek. I had no idea what was going on. Uh, despite this feeling of otherness, what makes him truly feel out of place or uncomfortable is seeing what those who are Orthodox Christians are doing during the services. Uh, we cross ourselves, we bow, we venerate icons, we stand for what seems like forever, uh, and, and many other peculiarities. And these things clearly delineate between a newcomer and an experienced churchgoer. We know who has been to church for a long time because they do these things. What must be understood is that our actions that are, we do during the church, strange as they may seem, flow from our faith, and they have been handed down to us by our forefathers. These actions are full of meaning, and it is through engaging in the physical aspects of Orthodox worship that the faithful pray and direct their minds to that which is from that which is worldly to that which is divine. For those of us who have been Orthodox for some time, uh, we've been conditioned to perform these actions, but do we? But have we taken the time to consider the meaning behind these actions? What, why we do the things we do, not just how we do the things we do. It is good and right to cross ourselves, to bow, uh, to do all of the rest. But if we don't understand why we are doing these things, they won't be very beneficial to us, and we won't be able to properly prepare ourselves to receive Christ in the chalice. These things are tools for us to achieve pure prayer. It is through prayer that we prepare ourselves to properly receive Christ in the chalice, and it is through prayer that we become who God created us to be, which is like Christ. How important, then, is it that we know how to worship in the church? So before we talk about these actions, uh, let's talk about what prayer is. Let's establish this. Uh, let's get a baseline here. So prayer is not just standing. Prayer is not just being present in church. It is not just looking at icons. Uh, it is something much deeper than this. According to St. Gregory Palamas, prayer is the highest of the virtues, and it puts us in a fit state to receive the deity, yet it does not actually unite us to him. But prayer, through its sacral and hieratic power, actualizes our ascent to and union with the deity, for it is a bond between noetic creatures and their creator. So prayer is a virtue, and being a virtue, it is cultivated through struggle on our part with God's help. St. Theophan the Recluse has a really excellent book on prayer. It is a series of letters he wrote to one of his spiritual children, and he describes prayer as a muscle. It is something that must be flexed, it is something that must be strained, and it is something that grows with use. So St. Theophan says that prayer must be awakened, then strengthened. One must be educated even to achieve the spirit of prayer. Prayer is not simply standing in church. It is a work, and it is a work that must be learned and cultivated. So how do we learn to pray? Chiefly, we learn to pray as a community through divine worship. It is through the services of the church that we learn the Orthodox faith, and we hear prayers from those who have lived lives of prayer themselves, the saints. All of the hymnography we hear comes from people of prayer who lived lives of prayer and produced prayers themselves for us to learn. Unlike the saints, however, we often begin our lives in the church by struggling to be attentive to the services. 
Why is this so? Why do we struggle to be attentive? St. Theophan the Reclus says that as people live, so do they behave in church. A church influences and somewhat supports spiritual movements, but then the usual course of one's spiritual constitution takes over. Therefore, if you want your time in church to consist of worthily standing in the face of the Lord, you must prepare yourself for this in your ordinary life. You must walk as much as you can in a prayerful frame of mind. So it is through how we live throughout the week that we gain or lose the ability to encounter Christ in the services. Our lives outside of the church, if properly ordered, will be a concerted effort to prepare for the next encounter with God in the divine services. Once we have encountered God, we must take what we have learned in the church and apply it outside in preparation for our next encounter. If we do this, then we will truly benefit from our time in church and increase in divine grace through our cultivation of prayer. The first thing that we learn then when we begin lives of prayer in the church is physical actions. We sign ourselves with the sign of the cross. We bow, we venerate icons, and so on and so forth. These are the main actions, and these are the ones that we will focus on today. So why do we learn physical actions when we pray? Why do these things matter? Uh, why aren't we like, say, the Quakers who simply sit in a circle and wait for somebody to be illumined by whatever spirit speaks to them? Because man is a composite being. He is soul and body. He is not just a soul. And thus, prayer must involve both his soul and his body in a proper order, the soul directing the body in worship. If we then make an effort to understand the meaning of these actions, then we can properly use them as tools and direct our bodies in worship to ascend to God, as the prodigal did when he traveled from a faraway city to return to his father's house. So the first and most common action that we see is the sign of the cross. The sign of the cross is the most common movement in Orthodox worship. It is an act in which the believer holding his right thumb, pointer, and middle fingers together, with the ring and the little finger touching down on the palm, touches his head, his stomach, his right, then left shoulders. This act is in itself a prayer. The common, most common prayer that is said is the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or simply, Lord, have mercy when we hear the litanies. And it is a confession of the saving work of Christ, who accomplished our salvation through the cross. The three fingers going to the head represent the Trinity, who is one God in three persons. And the two fingers touching the palm symbolize the incarnation of Christ, who condescended to us as fully God and fully man. The faithful cross themselves before entering the church. We cross ourselves in front of icons and throughout the service. Knowing when to cross oneself and how to properly cross oneself is important, and it can aid the believer in engaging with the services in a manner that is truly beneficial for our souls. The sign of the cross is itself powerful and should not be done in a flippant manner. St. Athanasius the Great says that by the sign of the cross, all magic ceases, all witchcraft is brought to naught, and all idols are deserted and abandoned. All irrational desire ceases. St. Anthony the Great worked great wonders simply by making the sign of the cross over those afflicted with a multitude of ailments. And I think it is clear that St. Athanasios, being a spiritual child of St. Anthony, had this in mind as he wrote this. St. Anthony, when people approached him, would make the sign of the cross with great care, and they were healed. Either the demons fled, or their diseases vanished, or whatever. But he did this not by saying any specific prayers, but by making the sign of the cross over them. The cross, that terrible tree on which the Savior tasted of death in the flesh, is now our sign of our hope. It is a wound of demons. It is the sign of our redemption. On this very Sunday, we triumphantly sing, Before thy cross we bow down and worship, O Master, and thy holy resurrection we hymn and glorify. We even wear this sign of Roman uh, punishment around our necks as a sign of victory for us. Because it is through the cross, as the Matin service says, on Sunday that joy has come to the world. So before entering the church, we cross ourselves three times. So this is the beginning of entering into the church, the beginning of our church etiquette is entering the church. We make three bows as well while we cross from the waist, and we say the following prayers. And these are examples of what we can pray. This is found in the Jordanville Prayer Book. We say, Thou hast created me, O God, have mercy on me. O God, cleanse me a sinner. Many are my sins against thee, O Lord, forgive me. We could also simply say, Lord, have mercy. 
We could also say, oh God, cleanse me a sinner. There are many different ways in which we can enter the church, but these three prayers, I think, are a very good example. Having humbled ourselves before the Lord, we can enter the church and lift our hearts to Christ. During the services, we cross ourselves at the end of litanies, exclamations from the priest, before and after the epistle and gospel readings, and before and after receiving Holy Communion. The only time in which we should not cross ourselves, at least according to the service books, is during the reading of the Cathisma, which is the Psalter readings, instead crossing ourselves with the Stasis, glory both now and alleluia, with the bows at the waist. We also should not cross ourselves when we are being sensed. And I will talk about that later. We should not be careless with the sign of the cross. We should not be flippant. We should not try and do it quickly. We should not, as one, um, I believe, a Tyremont Cosmos says, do the liturgical air guitar. We should not be quick and careless in our cross. We should be very careful when we do this. The Holy Fathers, namely St. Anthony the Great, says that the demons, while they fear the cross, rejoice when we cross ourselves with haste or without reverence. The demons rejoice when they see the cross done poorly. For in doing so, we confess our lack of love for Christ, and we confess our ability to be persuaded by the demons. We should be careful when we cross ourselves, that by doing so with great reverence, we might please the Lord through our prayer. We must also recognize that the cross is not magic. Doing it as many times as we possibly can is not going to change anything for us, and in fact, that might actually be detrimental. We should not expect the Lord to act on our behalf just because we have crossed ourselves. However, it can be said that the Lord draws near to those who draw near to him. And what better way to do so than through beginning our prayer with the sign of the cross. And then, as we discussed when entering the church, there are also bows. Bows are accompanied by the sign of the cross at times, but this is not always the case. There are also different types of bows. We bow simply our heads, as when the deacon... Uh, this is not a suggestion, and this is not something that we watch. When the deacon says, bow your heads to the Lord, he is telling the people to bow their heads to the Lord. This can either be done with a deep bow, or it can be done simply by bowing your head. These things that the deacon says, he's not simply yelling at a wall. He is leading the people in prayer. The deacon is telling you what to pray for. When the deacon says, for this land is authorities and armed forces, let us pray to the Lord, he is telling you as you sign yourself with the cross to pray for your civil authorities, to pray for the armed forces. When the deacon tells you to bow your heads, you should bow your heads. These are all things that the deacon is leading the people in. And these are very important things to do. So there is bowing from the head and from the waist. And there is also bowing all the way to the ground as we did today which is not normal. It is also called a prostration. We bow because we are in the presence of the king of all, who is on his throne, which is an altar. We, and it is fitting to fall before him to show our humility. Our commandrite, Zechariah, Zechariu, describes this as the path of the Lord, this path of humbling ourselves, of going low, who out of extreme humility worked out our salvation and raised our humanity from death to life. When we bow, we recognize our place as sinners before God, an act which involve, invokes repentance. Bowing the head and bows from the waist are used at all services. But bows to the ground, also known as prostrations, are only done on the weekdays and Saturdays at the divine and, and on Saturdays we do it at the divine liturgy. There are exceptions to this, namely feasts of the Lord and the other forty days after Pascha, where there are no prostrations. You do not prostrate. You have had all of Lent. You have had all of Lent to do as many prostrations as you can do on Pascha and throughout Bright Week and until the Ascension. Do not do prostrations. This is a time of celebration. It is also customary to prostrate more often during Great Lent and other lesser fasts. We do not prostrate on Sundays because each Sunday is a little Pascha. It is a celebration of the resurrection. And thus, as we don't prostrate on Pascha, we do not prostrate on Sundays. Of course, the only exception to this being today, or if the exaltation falls on a Sunday. So every seven years, there will be two Sundays in which you do prostrations. And that's it. Other than that, one Sunday a year. And that is this Sunday, which is a very unique portion of this feast. So during the services, there are also times when the faithful bow without crossing themselves. This is when the priest is offering a blessing or when the deacon is sensing the faithful. We don't cross ourselves here because we're receiving a blessing from the clergy, who are ministers of Christ. 
We do not cross ourselves because the cross is a blessing that we put upon ourselves. And so it would not be proper, after having received a blessing, for us then to cross ourselves. It is in a similar manner when we receive a blessing from a bishop or from a priest. We don't cross ourselves first. They are not icons. We are receiving something from them. We are not first blessing ourselves before approaching them for a blessing. So the faithful also bow when the deacon, as I said before, proclaims, let us bow our heads to the Lord. We also cross and bow at the waist during the Trisagion hymn and when venerating icons, which segues into the section titled Venerating Icons. So at the front of the church and throughout the rest of the church, but here in the barn, we have just the two icons. We have icons of the Savior and the Mother of God, and we also have the cross somewhere. Where is the cross? Oh, it's to my left. Uh, so we have, as well, many other icons. So it is customary for us, upon entering the church and upon leaving the church, to venerate the icons and to say a prayer. If it's to Christ, perhaps we can ask that he is merciful to us. If it's for a saint, we can ask for their prayers. If it's to the cross, we can say glory to thy precious cross and resurrection, and so on and so forth. This is done by crossing and bowing at the waist twice, kissing the icon, then crossing and bowing again. On weekdays, we do prostrations. And during Lent, we do prostrations as well. It is also customary to light a candle in front of certain icons. Uh, and this candle represents our prayers. As the wax melts, so too should our hearts melt before the presence of God, and we should be transformed by him. This, is, this act is done, this veneration to, is done to show honor to the person depicted in the icon. This is not, as some would claim, and I don't think anyone here would claim it, as worship of the icon. Um, we do not worship wood and glass and all these things. We simply honor those who are depicted thereof. So veneration of icons is good and it's perfectly orthodox, but there are times in which it is inappropriate. We should venerate the icons before we, or at when we arrive in church and when we leave, but only if we are arriving before the service has begun and after the service is over. Uh, the only exceptions to this being and matins at Palaiolaos when we venerate the icon, the festal icon and our anointed, and as well during the clergy communion, there is a lull in the service. This is a time in which the choir sings various pieces of music, and you are able to move around as you see fit. But it is very distracting for those who are seeking to pray to watch others in important portions of the service, moving around, venerating icons when this is simply not appropriate to be done at this time. And then there is other moving in the church. One thing that struck me when I first entered into um, St. Vladimir's was the lack of pews. I was very confused. Um, I remember I was, I had never really st spent that much time standing like that. And so it was, it was a very, it was a very interesting experience. I was also wearing a flannel and there was no power and it was in July and it was 98 degrees. And so it was just, it was a very interesting experience all around. I was drenched in sweat. There was nowhere to sit. I was very confused. Um, I think Father Gregory made a comment about my feet. He said, how are your feet? And I said, they're terrible. And yet I'm still here, thank God. So this peculiarity in our church, this lack of pews, allows freedom in our liturgical acts that we have mentioned above. And it is really necessary for these movements. Uh, but even though it is essential, it also provides a temptation to move throughout the temple through it at a whim. This makes sense for, say, a toddler. Um, I have been told, and I have seen it with my own child, you can either let the child move or they can scream. You don't have those two options. If we are adults, we cannot move and not scream. We are capable of doing this, um, and there are certain times in which certainly we absolutely should not move, and we should make sure our children, if they are old enough, are as well doing the same. So at St. Vlad's, and I had written this at a time when we weren't in a barn, but at St. Vladimir's, we have a schema using the three lampadas over the royal doors. Let's pretend like those are there for now. If there is only the center light on, that it means it is appropriate to move if you feel the need to, if there is a need to move. It does not just mean you are, it's open season. You can't just start doing laps around the church or whatever. If you need to move, you can move. If, however, there are three, well, all three lights are on, this is an indication that we are in a particularly solemn moment of the service, and movement is entirely inappropriate unless your life is absolutely at risk. If the church is on fire, you can move at this point. If the church is not on fire, if you are not on fire, if you are not dying, 
you should not move. You should be attentive to what is happening. You should stand. Um, we should be focusing our entire selves on the service, body and soul, that our hearts may be softened by the service and we may receive divine grace. One of the greatest acts we can accomplish while at the service is attentively allowing our hearts to be lifted up. That we may receive the King of all, as it says in the Cherubic Hymn, who cometh invisibly in triumph upon the ranks of angels. This is the goal of the service, to encounter God, to be changed by God. And if we allow ourselves to do this, then we have succeeded. We have succeeded in the service. Outside of St. Vladimir's, how can we determine when it is appropriate to move in church? How great is the temptation to worship like we were raised in a barn? This is actually something I found very interesting. It was the first week we had moved into the barn. There were some children running outside and inside, and one of the adults said, what were you, raised in a barn? And I thought about that as we were sitting in a barn after celebrating the liturgy. It was a very, it, it was funny to me. So anyways, the following instances are when we should not, absolutely not, move through the services, through the liturgy. The Great Actenia, for example, the beginning uh, litany, we should not move during this time. The entrances, when the clergy are leaving the altar, we should not move. During the epistle and gospel readings, when those sacred texts, the words of our Lord, are read, we should be attentive. And especially during the anaphora, which is where we consecrate the body and blood, the bread and the wine become the body and blood. This is from the creed until the Our Father. There should be no movement. We should not be walking around. If you are outside of the church at this time, stay outside in the narthex. Um, if you are inside, you should not be running around, unless, of course, you are a toddler. This is, would be the only exception to this. And even then, you should try and make sure your toddlers aren't running around too much. So at the evening services, we should also not move during the Great Actenia and the entrances. The prophecy and gospel readings, we should also be attentive to. And during the six psalms and at the great doxology, this is when the doors open, the priest says, Glory to thee who has shown us the light, and we sing the great doxology, also at the reading of the gospel. The only time we should really move in the evening services or in the morning services, the only time where it's appropriate is when the priest or deacon is sensing the icons in the church. It's simply not practical for the deacon to run through you. We all make better uh, walls than we do doors. So we should move into the center of the church. So in conclusion, what should we do if we see those around us, if we seek to adhere to these rules and we see others who are not doing them, if we are not following these rules? The biggest temptation is to judge them, is to think of ourselves as better than them because we are holding to all of these customs, we are holding to all of these rules. The first thing that we should remember is that if we judge them, the Lord will judge us. He will judge us according to that which we judge. So we should avoid this. And unless we've been given the explicit blessing of the rector to address such behavior, it is likely not our responsibility to address this behavior. Unless, say, Father Gregory or the parish warden, who we call the Starrets, has told you, go correct this. Do not do it. Do not do it. Simply pray for them. So the warden... And the parish clergy, uh, the warden is the direct assistant to the rector, and it is his role, along with the clergy, to see to it that the good order be observed in the church during the divine services. So that is his job. His job is to deal with any uh, misbehavior, as well as the clergy. So if the clergy come and speak to you and say something happened, so on and so forth, we should be responsive to this. We should be receptive to these things. We should also be attentive not only to our own selves, but to those who are under us, like our children, uh, if we have any. Lest we, and let us avoid falling into the sin of pride and looking at others and condemning them for, say, how they handle their own selves and their own children. If we learn to pray in church, then the actions of others will not be a concern to you. There was a story uh, in the UK. Someone came up to Metropolitan Anthony Bloom and said to him, Vladika, uh, I, I wish to learn how to pray, but I have such trouble. There are so many children running around. He said, I, I can't pray when I do this. And, and Vladika said, well, once you have truly learned how to pray, this will not be an issue to you. In other words, once we are attentive to our own selves, once we have entered into our own hearts, the actions of others will not be a concern to us. Instead, we will be standing in the presence of the Lord. So what should we do if we adhere to proper church etiquette, etiquette and our minds still wander? Modern man, as we talked about last week, is fragmented. We live in an age of endless distraction that has been further exacerbated by technology and designed to keep us disordered and held under its sway. 
The Holy Fathers have given us one more weapon in our liturgical arsenal that we have not talked about, and that is the prayer room, with which we enter into ourselves and recite the prayer of the heart, which is, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. St. Theophon was an ardent advocate of, this pra of the prayer room, saying that in order to more conveniently become accustomed to the remembrance of God, for this, the fervent Christian has a special means, namely to repeat unceasingly the brief prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. If you have not yet heard this, then hear it now. And if you have not yet done it, then begin to do it from this time. So if you have not been aware of this prayer, now is the time for you to begin. Use the prayer rope when your mind wanders in the church. And through careful recitation of the Jesus prayer, we can bring our minds back into attention. We can bring our minds into a whole state as the Lord has called us to, to be full people. And this, in this we will achieve attention in the services. So it is my hope that through careful adherence to the proper order of the services, we will all become by grace what God is by nature, that is divine human beings, fully God and fully man. May we be strengthened by the power of the cross to complete our Lenten fast with frequent attendance of the divine services through which we can achieve prayer. Are there any questions or comments and concerns? I take those two. It's one of the 12 feasts, but it's of the mother of God. So if, if it's of the Lord, one of the 12, the, the six great feasts of the Lord, we do not do prostrations. We do prostrations, right, Father? Yes. Generally, yes. when it's a, a feast of the mother of God, we don't do prostrations when we come into the church or even when we venerate the icon, but at the liturgy, when the, when the gifts are consecrated, uh, we do that. So that, that's really the, the, the difference between the feast of the Lord and the feast of the mother of God. Um, it's not a regular week. And when the chalice is coming out, right? Right, exactly. And you'll in the clergy, like when the clergy enter the altar, they will also do prostrations before the altar. So do less prostrations, yeah. but still do prostrations. The prayer of Saint Ephraim. Actually, I haven't looked at the vigil yet. It might be part of the vigil because this, the, in the Tipicon, which says how do you do the services, this feast has the biggest entry. If you see Father Gregory stand in front of the iconostas and start saying the prayer of St. Ephraim, or something that might sound like it, then it's time to do prostrations. It's the first service of Monday, yeah. So I mean, it, it's it's supposed the service is, is technically supposed to be held in the evening, right. but it's just yeah, as a, as a practical measure, it's kind of like the um, kneeling vespers for Pentecost. We just do it right after the liturgy because it's more practical. It's better to have everyone in the church do it than just the people who want to come back to church or who can come back to church. Yes, the only exception to that is today, when we do prostrations before the cross. Right. And on the exaltation of the cross, 
as well. So we sing at the end of the liturgy, we sing before thy cross, and on Holy Wednesday, when we say the prayer of St. Ephraim for the last time after the pre-sanctified liturgy. We do the final prostrations that you do in the church until the cross is brought out. If you feel at all your stomach upset, do not do prostrations. Do not. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and the same with weekday liturgies. If you haven't received uh, communion and the chalice is presented, you would do a prostration. No, so, not on, not on Sundays, weekdays. Yeah, and weekday liturgies is the same thing. So, and on pre-sanctified liturgy, yeah, you would do prostrations when the chalice is uh, when the chalice is presented. So, but if you've received, then no, unless it's the Sunday of the cross, which is today. Or every seven years when the exaltation falls on a Sunday as well. It was the only two exceptions to that. So it might be very interesting to uh, think about if, if you're coming from a uh, Protestant uh, upbringing, that my husband actually was really uh, moved uh, to become Orthodox because the way that all our body and mind. Right. So when he saw, you know, that it's, uh, we do that physically, just, you know, as much as we pray in the mind. Right, and that certainly was very attractive to me as well, being raised Protestant. I mean, uh, I was raised Evangelical Presbyterian, and um, there, there are these jokes. There's a satirical website that talks about how um, Presbyterians installed motion sensor lights, and halfway through the service they turned off. Um, people simply do not move. They do not move. And so it's, it was very difficult growing up being told, oh, you need to pray. And it's like, well, you just need to stand there still and say nothing. That just doesn't make any sense. So for someone like me coming into the church as well, it was very refreshing seeing that there was an actual physical aspect of it. Our bodies are not just this husk that we are stuck in. It's, it's we, are full we are full beings. Our body is a part of who we are, and so we use it in prayer. And that's also, I mean, that was the big thing about the fall. The fall caused this disorder in us where our spirits became subjected to the stomach, became subjected to the body, and so we had this disordered life. So the, the physical actions of prayer just restore that natural order where the spirit is directing the body. Yes, um, that, was, that was Father Seraphim, no, that was um, St. Germanus of Constantinople. He was talking about the anaphora. He says when, when you create, when you move during the anaphora, you are, you are enacting the fall again, is essentially what he says. He says you're, you're enacting that same disorder that caused all of our problems. So That's a very interesting book. Uh, but I, I think what Brian was hinting at was Right, and that was something that I had thought of and didn't include in here, but I mean, St. Paul, a lot of his epistles, especially his first epistle to the Corinthians, he's dealing mostly with liturgical abuse. I mean, the people were, uh, were engaging in feasts at their own homes before they were going to receive Holy Communion. Some of them were arriving to church drunk, and then they were supposed to receive the sacraments, and as a result, they were getting sick and they were dying because they were receiving unworthily. And so St. Paul was very concerned about this. He was concerned about um, good order. One of the other things he also said was we should not read other prayers while the certain prayers are being read in church. So there, there's much more to church etiquette than that was just that I just discussed. This is not like if you wanted if we wanted to go over everything that we're supposed to do in church, we would be here until Pascha and maybe longer. So I I, I just decided to cover the main things and uh, we'll go from there. Right. 
yeah, that's, I, I believe that's in the section, How to Pray in Church. And it says, yeah, don't use the prayer book unless you're reading along with the liturgy. Yeah, we shouldn't be reading other prayers while prayers are being said in the church. We should be attentive to what is being said. If, if you don't understand because we're five people here, you don't understand what's being said, uh, first of all, try to read along in the language that you know, and then you will learn the approach. It doesn't take that long. Right? Our, our, we are relatively, uh, people with relatively big brains, so we can figure that out. But if you just can't get it or you're just kind of lost, that's a nice time to say the beast. If, if you're not For, um, for the Kalivadi's fathers, they were Greek saints. Um, at, at not quite, it was about 100 years before the, uh, the Greek independence. There were these saints that arose, and it was in a time in which the Greek church had really gone slack, and, um, and they emphasized uh, frequent attention to the, or frequent attendance to the services, frequent prayer. They also themselves were very holy men and so when they would celebrate the liturgy there were times where they'd be enraptured with the service and would not move and so th this is one story i read of um i can't remember which one it was it may have been saint cosmos Hayatolos, but he was so enraptured with the great entrance that he did not leave the altar for two hours and he made hesse casts out of everyone who was there because they simply said the jesus prayer they did not know what to do so for the for the greeks this was a very popular practice is to use the jesus prayer during the services especially at that point in time because um, everything was stretched out. The music was much harder to understand because they were just stretching out words. Um, you could be on and for like five minutes. Also, the <laughs> level of education was very low because yes. the long and the, the mm. sort of real uh, attack on theological education. Yes. But what's interesting about those fathers, though, the main thing that they were, that they were uh, trying to get people to pay attention to was not to do memorial service on Sunday. Yes. That was their main and to commune on Sundays. Yes. And so Lydia is very, very strict about that. So maybe you've come to me and said, let's do a panikita after liturgy on Sunday. And I'll say, it's got to either be a before vigil on Saturday, or maybe after if there's just no other way, but not on Sunday. And uh, St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco was, was apparently very strict about that. And Lydia picked that up, and it was his time in St. John's that memorial services just are not done on Sunday. You remember people at the Great Entrance? So before before vigil, if you wish to have a panakita, it has to happen before vigil. That's that's the general rule. Occasionally, we'll right. after, there's just no other way. But yes. You didn't mention what the story you were talking to the kids about. It's interesting. Um, I didn't know that that you said that um, when we um, did prayers in the Theotokos system, some uh, offer for consecration. Um, we should pray about our. The departed loved ones. And then, and yeah. Then it was about this, uh, the and then so, you just said when Deacon is um, sensing. sensing. I, I just remember it all, all actually. And then not, yeah. So, yeah, in, 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 well, in the Slujebnik, it directs the deacon while the, wh when the priest says, especially for our most holy, most pure, most blessed, glorious Lady Theotokos, never Virgin Mary, the deacon then at that point prays for all of his departed loved ones. And, um, and I told the children there that that would be a good thing for them to practice uh, if they find their minds wandering. Pray for their departed loved ones when this happens. And then when the priest says, among the first, remember also, Lord, and then he commemorates the hierarchy, then the deacon prays for the living. So this is a good practice to have as well, to keep this attention, to um, pray for, just actually name names, people you know who are in need of prayers. If you have a list of people to pray for, this would be a good practice to 
to implement. So that was something I told the children to do. Yeah, it tells the deacon specifically to do that. And for St. Basil, uh, it also tells the priest to, to do that, which is interesting. St. John does it. Sophia or Thies.
Well, I think, I, I think the first thing would be simply to do it at, as parents do it. And our children ultimately are going to learn. They may try and get around it by saying person X, Y, or Z is doing this thing, but ultimately they're going to end up picking up what you do. Um, and, and that's just going to, that's all, that's going to be mostly what happens. So when the, when the priest says wisdom, well, when the deacon says wisdom or right, stand or right. And, um, and even then, you know, people will see that and people will start following along. So we should allow when, when bad behavior is, is being done in church, uh, unless, you know, as I said, Father Gregory has told you to just pray for those people um, and do what you know is best yourself. And, and well, obviously I'm not going to go in and correct people. Right. It's just a not going to get a yardstick. And What's interesting about the old believers? What's interesting about the old believers? They do stand with their arms crossed, but they stand still. Right? They, it, it's not that they stand with their arms crossed and they're moving them off. They do stand still. But it's, that's a very, very specific sort of subset of Orthodox people. We should try to, to stand still, of course. To, and I mean without moving them off a lot. That's absolutely right. Um, for some people, that's easier. Yeah, and I mean, some something about that along those lines in terms of Nietzsche's, the Kolivadi's fathers, when they prayed, sat on a short stool and curled up into a ball, basically. That was how they prayed. Even in the services, they would they would essentially crouch down. So there, there have been different practices throughout the history of the church in, in how one is to stand in church. But yeah, I, th I think it's perfectly acceptable and, and right and an honorable thing to actually stand aright when the deacon says to. Um, and yeah, I, I think if you are attentive to your own actions, especially your children are going to see that. And even if they complain, they're going to end up doing it, um, whether they realize it or not. And it may not be until they're, you know, older and moved on, but they're going to find themselves doing it. So I know that's certainly my case. Everything my dad would tell me as a kid, don't do this thing. And I would say, oh, what do you know? And now that I'm living on my own, I'm essentially my father. <laughs> and and uh, everything that he imparted onto me, I, I now do. So, yeah, I... I She doesn't know how to bow. She knows how to squat. So she'll throw, cross her arm around herself. We can't, haven't quite gotten the four points yet. It's just the two, and then she does squats. So, yeah. This. The other thing I was thinking, sometimes when uh, readers, or, you know, when people read, you know certain things that you have to close to yourself, right, while this read, like, you know, holy God, holy might. And if you read the good little, good little. Right. Okay. So. right, one thing, when I was a reader, one thing I found was really good, especially with when you have to say, Lord, have mercy a lot of times, I ended up making a prayer rope that had knots at each of the, or had divisions of each of the sections. We say either 12 or 40 times that I would actually have to, like, you know, I could only go as fast as my thumb, and that wasn't that fast, because uh, uh, that helped a lot in that regard. Um, Maybe when, you know, you work with the readers, uh, make sure that they do not read too fast. Right. Uh, especially the prayer that you know we have to close. And we were talking about that it's Kayla Peaches. Uh, right. It, it, encourages bad, it encourages bad behavior, which, yeah, is, is something certainly that needs to be corrected when it arises. Um, I think we as a parish do pretty good with that for the most part. Anytime we have, especially, I mean, most of the issues we'll find is with a new reader. And that's just the reality of the situation. The first time somebody gets on Clearos, they're not going to do a good job. <laughs> it's like, and especially, especially when you're nervous, you tend to read things faster. So it, when you're a new reader and you're, and you're nervous, you're going to read fast. But that's something that will work itself out. I mean, that's something that we'll, we'll get pointers on. So. Yeah, we continue to try to work with them. We also have religious uh, guidelines for readers which spread that. But in the beginning, there's Father Colin Mill that's, I think, very correct. It's mostly about 
Yeah, you, I mean, I think our readers are, are very good in this regard for the most part. Um, but also, I mean, with the pandemic, we had a, a ton of new readers show up because we just had so many more services. So th I think that issue, really with the pandemic, it exacerbated a lot of these things because all of a sudden we found ourselves worshiping in a tent and then we were in a barn. And then, it, so it's just, it really just kind of upended our, our norms. So even if we were in good behavior, we might have found ourselves practicing bad behavior just because we were so uh, thrown off from this new environment. But I think with readers as well, that, that's an issue that, that is especially for us unique to this past year, where we just had you know eight or nine new people just show up to Clearos. So, but the, which was great, and they're doing a very good job now. Um, I, I think a lot of, a lot of that is, is simply with time, these problems are, are gone. They work themselves out. everyone and it's a sign for the altar servers to get back into the altar so they're waiting for that blessing to move back in but it's a blessing to everyone so everyone should bow it's when at the beginning of the service what's very interesting yeah that's at the little entrance yeah. what's very interesting though is if there are no altar servers there'll just kiss the icon kind of like how when there's not a deacon certain litanies aren't said yes, exactly. but at our parish really we never see that so uh, is that for many years are you talking about yeah, when they're, when they're being blessed with the cross. Uh, I've, I've seen I've seen both things done um, I've always crossed. Yeah, when you're, when you're being blessed with the cross, you're not cross. Yeah, so. When you're being blessed with the priest, priest when the priest's hands, or the bishop's hands, you don't cross. And when the chalice, chalice. Chalice comes out, you, you, you make the sign of the cross. Any more questions? Uh, so, when those uh, red and uh, especially the Uh, it's what it, it's what is said in this in the service book. It says you cross your well. I think the best way, and this is what amazes me. Um, I, I don't understand to this day why the Russians don't float in their prayer because when the service tells them to sit, they do not. They still stand. Um, the kathisma kathisma is Greek for the sitting. You are to sit. It is a litur it is another liturgical command. It, it means sit, and stasis means stand. You stand for the glory. So you cross yourself when you're standing, but when you're sitting, you don't cross yourself. So, yeah, that was always an interesting thing to me, why, why we stand through the kathisma when you're told, and the, the title of it is, is sit. For the Greeks, they sit at that point. They sit during the, the kathismas. Right, and you, you should, but I think that practically either people don't know or there's, like, you can't get to the bed. There's not enough room. Here, here at our parish especially, there is simply not enough room. But at, at a place like, say, um, uh, the monastery in Rives Junction, they have the, everyone sits at the cathisma because they have enough seats. They have the seats at all the pillars and they have the, the individual seats lining the, the walls. So everyone will... S what? They do full cathismas, yes. Their, their vigil ends something around 10 p.m. So it's... At that point, it doesn't make much sense. It, it doesn't, especially if, like, say, the psalm is three verses. There's no point in sitting. You're going to end up exerting yourself more sitting down and standing up. But that's like the, the lull of the service is, is that's there for you to sit. Um, 
Yeah, but that's why you wouldn't cross yourself because you're sitting, I believe. As soon as we turn off the recording, I'll call it. We will use the call to Bismarck in the first place. Thanks for the call.